Good morning. Welcome to Stand on the Word. Thanks for joining me today. Two very powerful chapters. They are related only by the fact that they occurred during the reign of Jehoiakim, two very separate uh, stories here. So we're going back to a period between 609 and 598 BC. In chapter 35, God instructs Jeremiah to use a faithful family as an example to an unfaithful nation. Let's begin in verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, go to the house of the Rechabites and speak with them and bring them to the house of the Lord into one of the chambers. Then offer them wine to drink. I brought them into the house of the Lord in the chamber of the son of Hanan, the son of Adaliah, the man of God, which was near the chamber of the officials, above the chamber of Maaseiah, the son of Shalom, keeper of the threshold. Then I set before the Rechabites pitchers full of wine and cups, and I said to them, Drink wine. But they answered, We will drink no wine, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, You shall not drink wine, neither you nor your sons forever. You shall not build a house, you shall not sow seed, you shall not plant or have a vineyard, but you shall live in tents all your days, that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. We have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, and all that he commanded us, to drink no wine all our days, ourselves, our wives, our sons, our daughters, and not to build houses to dwell in. We have no vineyard or field or seed, but we have lived in tents and have obeyed and done all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against the land, we said, Come, and let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans, and the army of the Syrians, so we are living in Jerusalem. A few things I want us to see about this chapter, chapter 35. Number one, I want you to see the influence of a father. The Rechabites were descendants of Jethro. Now, that was Moses' father-in-law. They were proselytes. They they uh, joined with the children of Israel in following Yahweh. Jonadab was described in 2 Kings chapter 10 as being zealous for God and known for his wisdom and his piety during the days of Jehu. Now, that was 300 years prior to Jehoiakim in this period that we're talking about. So for 300 years, the influence of this father continued to guide their, his, his descendants. So what was it he talked to them about? Well, from right here, what we have in this passage, two main points. Number one, there was a call to temperance, exercising self-restraint. You know what? Discipline is a good thing. You know, restricting those things that um, can be bad doesn't necessarily mean they are bad, but in excess, they certainly can be. But it's okay to restrain your appetites. You know, we have this idea today, if it feels good, do it. Well, that's not biblical. But here, the influence of father said, look, don't partake of the wine. Uh, No wine. And then he also, there was this call to understand the temporal nature of things. They were exercising a proper understanding of the world, not building houses, not setting up all these things that they thought were permanent, but rather focused on the eternal. And quite frankly, that made them a hearty bunch. Then verse 12, then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, go and say to the people of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction and listen to my words, declares the Lord? The commandment that Jonadab, the son of Rechab, gave to his sons to drink no wine has been kept, and they drink none to this day, for they have obeyed their father's command. I have spoken to you persistently, but you have not listened to me. I have sent to you all my servants, the prophets, sending them persistently, saying, Turn now every one of you from his evil way and amend your deeds, and do not go after other gods to serve them, and then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to you and your fathers. But you did not incline your ear or listen to me. So he's saying, look, these folks, these Rechabites, they listened to their father. They have obeyed him. You've not listened to me. You, you won't even listen to me, let alone obey me. So now we see the example. We see this example of a godly father, I mean, the, the influence of this father. Now we see the example of this faithful family. They resisted the pressure to conform. They were in the city, but they didn't live like the city. Look what's it, verse 18. But to the house of the Rechabites, Jeremiah said, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the commands of Jonadab, your father, and kept all his precepts and done all that he commanded you. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall never lack a man to stand before me. So they were, there was this, this, they were an example of a faithful family. 
they resisted the pressure to conform. Now, they came to Jerusalem because of the external threats of the Chaldeans, but they didn't act like the people in Jerusalem. They kept focused on what their father had called them to do. You know, Jesus said, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're in the world, but we're not to act like the world. We're not to look like the world. We're to be separate. That's what sanctification is. We're a part of, in, in this family of Jonadab, they were sanctified. They were set apart from others. And this brings about a legacy of faithfulness. God says, look, they'll never, he'll never lack to have a man standing before me. That's the legacy of faithfulness. Now, I ran across this a number of years ago. It was a comparison of two men from the 1700s who both lived in New York City. The first was uh, Max Jukes, Jukes, uh, not, not in New York City, but in the state of New York. Max Jukes, Jukes did not uh, believe in Christ nor give his children Christian training. He refused to take his children to church, even when they asked. And uh, according to this record a number of years ago, he had over 1,026 descendants, 300 of whom were sent to prison for an average term of 13 years. Some 190 were prostitutes and 680 were admitted alcoholics. His family members cost the state hundreds of thousands of dollars and they made no known contribution to society. Now, the other man in this, this comparison was Jonathan Edwards. He loved the Lord and he saw that his children were in church every Sunday. He served the Lord to the best of his ability. Of his 929 descendants, again, when this was recorded, 430 were ministers, 86 became university professors, 13 became university presidents, 75 wrote positive books, seven were elected to the U.S. Congress, and one served as vice president of the United States. His family never cost the state one cent, but contributed immeasurably to the common good. That's the legacy. And it all begins with the influence of a father, the example of a faithful family, and that legacy that is produced by faithfulness. All right, very quickly, chapter 36, a book burner, the king, Jehoiakim. This occurs in 604 BC. The Babylonians had conquered Ashkelon and the countdown clock was ticking for Judah, for Jerusalem's destruction. So this prompted a fast. We read this in verse nine. In the fifth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, all the people in Jerusalem and all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem proclaimed a fast before the Lord. But as we will see by the king's response to the word of the Lord that came from the prophet Jeremiah, I don't think he really wanted to hear from God. It was more of a ritualistic fast, at least for the king. So four things I want us to see about this chapter quickly. And I want to encourage you to read the whole thing. We won't have time to read the entire chapter. But I want you to see, number one, the preparation for the moment of opportunity. Sometimes the preparation comes long before we have the opportunity. But if the opportunity is there, we're not prepared. We can't do it. Look at verse one. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days of Josiah until today. So this was the whole time. Now, before we saw where he was to write a letter to the exiles. This is to put all of the prophetic word words that the Lord had given him into a book. So that was the preparation for what we see in verse five is the prime moment of opportunity. This fast had been called and Jeremiah ordered Baruch saying, I am banned from going to the house of the Lord. So you're to go and on a day of fasting in the hearing of the people, in the Lord's house, you shall read the words of the Lord from the scroll that you have written at my dictation. You shall read them also in the hearing of all the men of Judah who come out of their city. So long before the Lord called him to make this preparation, to write, this, write the prophecies into a book, a fast is called, the people are gathered, and then the word goes forth. So what is the purpose of the word? Well, we read that in verse 3. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the disaster that I intend to do to them so that everyone may turn from his evil way and that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then drop down to verse seven. It may be that their plea for mercy will come before the Lord and that everyone will turn from his evil way for this, for great is the anger and wrath that the Lord has pronounced against this people. So that was the purpose of the word. God prepared the prophet then the, the moment of opportunity came, and this was the purpose to see people 
if they would turn back to God. But now we see the response to the word. First, we see it in the princes. Verse 16, when they heard all these words, that is the princes, they turned one to another in fear. And they said to Baruch, we must report all these words to the king. They were fearful. They, this touched their hearts. They were concerned about what this word of the Lord said. Now, the king, he had a different response. The king and his servants had disdain. There was no awe or reverence for God in his word. Uh, verse 23, we read about it. Jehudai read three or four columns. The king would cut them off with a knife and throw them into the fire in the fire pot until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. Yet neither the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words was afraid, nor did they tear their garments. And then the king ordered for Jeremiah and his scribe to be arrested. He had no fear. Uh, he had hostility toward the word of God. But take note of this. As you read the rest of the chapter, God told the prophet to write it once again. In fact, if you read the very last verse, he added even more words to it. But take note of this. The message of God will not be silenced. It doesn't matter what they do. I know it can be frustrating. I'm sure Jeremiah was like really frustrated when the, he got word that the entire scroll had been burned. But the message of God will not be silenced. But those who seek to silence the word of God, they will ultimately be silenced. And we read that in this chapter. Father, thank you for your word. And, and Lord, I just want to thank you for the influence of a, of a godly father and the, the example of a, of, of a faithful family. And Lord, the, the legacy that faithfulness will produce. And I pray, Father, we could start right there, that you would challenge us as fathers, grandfathers, to, to, to be faithful and use our influence to encourage our children and grandchildren to walk with you. And I pray for those faithful families, that they would be an example to their neighbors and to their communities and to the entire nation. And Lord, may you bless the legacy, just as you promised from Jonadab, that he would never lack having a man stand before you because of the faithful legacy. Lord, that's one way we can change a nation, is just simply by starting in our families. Lord, may your word May your word guide us. May the Holy Spirit bring us into a full understanding of your word and give us the strength, the humility, and the ability to live it out in such a way that it changes the world around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me today. Again, the reading plan is at frc.org slash Bible. And do me a favor, invite someone else to join us on this journey. We're about to enter into a new book. Be a great time to start preparing folks to uh, join us on this journey. In fact, if one way might be to point them to the uh, to the 40 day journey we did through Jeremiah, they can do that. Maybe they'll get the bug and want to join us for the rest of the journey. But until next time, keep standing on the word.